All right, I think as people are coming in, we will begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Boating Coffee Break for the spring semester. My name is Cole Crawford, and I'm the Assistant Director of Employer Relations in Bowdoin's Office of Career Exploration and Development. I am a member of the class of Bowdoin class of 2020, and I use he, him pronouns. The Coffee Break program is jointly conducted by the Office of Development and Alumni Relations and the Office of Career Exploration and Development. It is a series of conversations with accomplished alumni about their career paths and whatever insights they're willing to share with the Bowdoin community. We'll take some time toward the end to answer your questions, but no need to wait until then to ask them. The Q&A feature is now open for your questions, so please go ahead and enter them at any time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this program just by clicking the icon on your screen that says live transcript or has CC in it. It is my pleasure to introduce Marguerite Mariscal, who is a member of the Bowdoin class of 2011. Marguerite is the CEO of Momofuku Group, a family of restaurants, home cooking products, and more. The company began when Chef David Chang founded Momofuku Noodle Bar in New York City in 2004, which Bon Appetit magazine called the most important restaurant in America. The blossoming company has expanded its presence internationally with restaurants in the United States, Canada, and Australia, and an online marketplace to order the flavors of Momofuku right to your door. Marguerite's career trajectory is a great plug for both the power of the Bowdoin liberal arts education and the power of internships. After graduating from Bowdoin with a major in English and a minor in history, Marguerite began at Momofuku as a public relations intern in 2011. She picked up responsible responsibility for design and communications for the company, and in 2016 was named brand director. In 2018, Marguerite was promoted to chief of staff and creative director. And in 2019, she was named chief executive officer, completing her rise from intern to CEO in less than eight years. Marguerite, thank you for being with us today. and Welcome back to Bowdoin-ish. Yeah. Great to be here. Marguerite, I, I think there's no better place to start than all the way back at the beginning for you. You're a born and raised New Yorker with deep roots in New York City food. Your family has owned and operated the legendary Upper West Side Delhi Zabars for generations. Uh, your bi biography on Momofuku's company website emphasizes that you have spent every year of your life in New York City, with one key exception, the quote, four majestic years in Maine. What about Bowdoin and Maine drew you away from your native New York City? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm someone who, uh, my, my grandparents grew up in New York City, my mom grew up in New York City, and uh, I, I think I assumed that I would be back there at some point. So I definitely wanted to take time uh, in college to not be in New York City. Um, and Maine uh, just seemed like a great place to spend four years. And just the proximity to uh, Portland, the proximity to the water, um, proximity to skiing, um, it just felt like a good escape or, or something that was a little different from what I was used to. Um, and it's funny because I think a lot of people, when they go to Bowdoin, they think of it as being small, but I, my grade in high school, I think was about like 90 or 80 kids. So to me, you know, 400 was huge. Uh, I know that was not maybe the case for some other people. So it felt like a big step and a big school, uh, even, even if it's small by other people's standards. And also kind of staying on that same vein, like what experiences did you take away from your time at the college as you've begun your career? I mean, all the way back from the beginning when you started out in 2011 at Momofuku all the way to today. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, one part of it I think was going to Bowdoin, I maybe realized that I wasn't uh, as normal or I would say with the way that like my family ate or my friends ate was not necessarily the same as other people. So I was, uh, like constantly in, I mean, the town of Brunswick has amazing food, constantly going to Boston, constantly going to Portland, um, constantly going to whatever the new restaurant was that opened. And I think I realized that that was maybe not necessarily normal behavior for, for every freshman. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I took that with me for sure. Um, and also I did went some internships when I was at Bowdoin in marketing and branding for like uh, some companies like the Sundance Channel and just uh, selected shorts on NPR just things that I thought were interesting. And I think when I started working at uh, Momofuku, it was not because it was restaurants. I really think I really saw it as being a brand. Um, you know, it, it not only had restaurants, but Dave had just done this show called The Mind of a Chef. There was a magazine. 
Um, they had, I think it was three restaurants in New York City and then one in Australia. Like that was the only restaurant. So it really wasn't following any sort of traditional trajectory for a, uh, for a restaurant group. So I think I was just interested in what they believed in um, and what they were trying to do, which is I think like democratize food to some extent. Um, you know, if that fancy restaurants or good food, I should say, didn't need to be in fancy restaurants. You could have, you know, uh, a really, you know, intentional meal, uh, even if it didn't have white tablecloths or it didn't have this like kind of uh, fashion of what dining used to be. Um, and I thought that was a really, you know, am amazing, interesting perspective um, that, you know, I was just excited to work for. I didn't really even think about it as, as being restaurants. I think it's amazing when, you know, like looking at Momofuku, reading about it on the internet, like it's kind of astonishing staying on the topic of branding just to see how consistent it is and sort of how well developed the branding in particular is throughout the entire kind of vast brand that Momofuku has. I mean, you've expanded so much internationally, you've expanded to shipping products to people's stores. Like, can you talk a little bit about how, like, as you've begun your career at Momofuku, how it's expanded just from restaurants from just a handful in New York City. Like, can you talk about how you've been able to keep Momofuku's original branding and spirit intact? Sure. I mean, I, I think what's interesting is I think it's about keeping certain things and getting rid of others. Um, and I think that what a lot of brands do, um, uh, there's something that we always talk about, which is what got us here won't get us there, which is uh, the title of a book by Marshall Goldsmith. And you know, I think we, there are certain pieces that are always going to be core. So for us, one of those things is adding value. So the idea is that whether it's a two Michelin star tasting menu meal or a fried chicken sandwich, it should feel like a value, like you got something out of it. And uh, similarly, whether it's, you know, you're eating at Noodle Bar or you're at Madison Square Garden, whatever it is, it should all feel kind of part of this whole. Um, and, you know, that idea of democratizing food, I think that's kind of something that stays. I think as we've expanded, it's been really interesting of like, what do we need to evolve? What do we need to adapt and get better at? So like one example uh, that I love is that uh, our restaurant in the East Village, um, the original location noodle bar, the service is like very fast paced. You know, we do a ton of uh, turns every day. Um, and then we opened up a noodle bar in Toronto and we had the team in New York train the team in Toronto. And everyone in Toronto was like, why is everyone so mean? Because the service was just like New York <laughs> Uh, like, you know, what, what we know, which was very brisk and very, um, you know, just getting the job done, which just didn't translate to this new market with the new team and, and the expectations. So we like retrained everyone again to be uh, a little bit more gracious and accommodating. And I think it's a good example of like what might work in New York doesn't necessarily work in Toronto and you can't like, you know, uh, hang on those laurels. You have to keep evolving for where you're going and changing. And I think something that we do really well as a brand is you know, stick to the guns on the things that we think matter, but then have a ton of flexibility um, based on, you know, what the market is, who your customer is, and, and don't get so hung up on what worked for you before. I think it's really interesting that you, like, I mean, there was an article on you in the New York Times, they called you Momofuku's secret sauce. Um, one thing that you said in that article is that you borrowed from Warren Buffett in describing how you built a competitive moat between Momofuku and its imitators. And you asked the question, uh, what makes us unique when anyone from Portland to Denver can build a plywood restaurant and sell a pork bun? So how do you know when it's time to retire an idea once considered novel? And where do you draw inspiration from as you separate yourself from the competition? Um, I mean, I think it's maybe less about retiring an idea and kind of maybe even going deeper Right. So I think a, an example of that um, is we started in 2010. Uh, there was a culinary lab that started making products for our restaurants. Once again, with this idea of a competitive moat where, you know, it's not what if it's not just about the way that you combine these ingredients that are unique, but what if you actually have proprietary ingredients that other people don't have? Um, and so, you know, in the, the example that was in that article that you're talking about was, you know, we've been selling these, these clamshell buns forever, which we get from an amazing place in New York. Um, but, you know, what would it look like if we were to make them ourselves? And could we make all these different shapes that maybe other people don't have access to? So I think it's about doubling down on what works and continuing to, um, you know, push forward and not just resting on the idea because this is our number one product or, you know, this is working right now. But what's the thing in a couple of years that's going to put you like, you know, in the front of the pack or what's going to make your business unique when there's, you know, more competition 
you know, pre pre COVID, I mean, still is the case. There's more competition than ever, right? I mean, the number of restaurants that are popping up and incredible restaurants, um, you know, we feel like we have to keep evolving uh, if we want to stay relevant. I think I want to continue more on that vein, but just before we lose track of it, like one term that you mentioned earlier that I thought was really interesting was you want to democratize food. Can you talk a little bit more about like what you mean by that or sort of how you conceptualize that idea in your head? Sure. Um, you know, I think for, for, for Dave, when he started out, um, so there's this line that was in a New York Times uh, review of Noodle Bar uh, in like 2004, 2005, that said, you know, it was essentially applying four star techniques, like New York Times rating system, four is the most, but to like humble ingredients. So it doesn't have to be a luxury ingredient to give it the attention and the time. Um, and you see that, you know, in Japan, uh, which, you know, we started out with a ramen uh, restaurant called Noodle Bar, and it came from that idea, right? Like uh, in Japan, um, there's, you know, people that dedicate their lives to a single ingredient, right? Or dedicate their lives to, to um, uh, tempura, to soba, to udon, to ramen. And it's all, you know, separate and, and, and really honing. And I think Dave, who lived in Japan at the time and was teaching uh, English, uh, came back and was like, why aren't we doing this? Why do we have, you know, the idea that a good restaurant needs to be at this high price point and a good restaurant where they're consciously sourcing the ingredients needs to be, uh, white tablecloths and, and luxurious. And so he started basically applying those same principles that he learned working for um, some of the you know best restaurants in New York, but to food that he wanted to eat. Um, so it really, I think, changed um, the conversation, at least in New York City, around you know what a good restaurant was. So uh, in 2007, Sambar, which is the second restaurant that he opened, got three stars from the Times. And it was a like no reservation, uh, you know, super fast paced um, restaurant in the East Village, which at the time, that's not what a three star restaurant looked like. A three star restaurant had, you know, a maitre d' and a host and all of these, you know, and a sommelier and all of these different pieces. Um, and I think, you know, what we've been trying to do uh, moving forward, and especially in the pandemic, is apply that same logic to packaged products, right? That we can send people in their homes that, um, you know, a lot of restaurants, when they do consumer packaged goods, you know, for example, it'll be like a can of soup with a chef's face on it, right? And that doesn't taste anything like the soup that you're going to get at that restaurant. And what we're trying to do is make ingredients that both our restaurants want to use and home cooks can use as well. So it's the same soy sauce, it's the same chili crunch, it's the same seasonings that we're using in our restaurants uh, that you can use as a home cook. So for us, that's kind of like democratizing the, you know, what we're using. Uh, to, to have at home as opposed to kind of making this like a simile of maybe kind of like what you might have had at this restaurant for you to, to, to create yourself. I think like that sort of in my mind like what you're saying sort of encompasses like a really kind of broad and expansive idea of like you know inclusivity like normal people can take in food they can uh, cook with it they can use it they can kind of connect with it in that way and I think it's you know kind of extraordinary what the power of food has to you know promote equity and to you know connect people together. Yeah. Um, something I really wanted to touch on you on is you know the COVID nineteen pandemic has brought extraordinary challenges to all Americans, but its social consequences have particularly impacted Asian Americans. Chefs and restaurateurs of the AAPI community have noted the disconnect between Americans' love of Asian American food and growing hate against Asian Americans. Momofuku has been a leader in building this love of Asian American food, with New York Times crediting Momofuku with um, the rise of contemporary Asian American cuisine. So now, in this sort of historical social moment, what role will Momofuku have to amplify AAPI voices and facilitate acceptance for the Asian American community beyond its food? Totally. Um, I mean, I think it, it is really like tragic to see what's happening, especially as you noted, uh, like Asian American food as it relates to like QSR concepts and grocery and all of that is like skyrocketing in terms of popularity over the past uh, year, uh, year or two. And then you obviously see on the other side what's happening in America. Um, you know, I think it's funny. I think it, Dave has done his part to democratize food, but something we talk about all the time is people's kind of capacity to pay for 
different cuisines, right? So, so something we talked a ton about um, is the idea that, you know, someone will happily pay like $28 for a bowl of pasta, but no one will pay $28 for a bowl of ramen, even though, you know, you can make the argument that more work is going into potentially one than the other. And so I think that there's definitely been strides in terms of education and awareness in food, but I wouldn't say by any means there's been reached any sort of equality in that idea and that we're still constantly combating the idea that uh, Asian food needs to be cheap and other food can be expensive or that, you know, the quality of ingredients. And I think, I don't know, what I think Momofuku has done in addition to, um, we did a virtual cooking class to uh, raise funds um, uh, to help fight uh, anti-Asian sentiment in America right now. Um, but I think also what Dave's trying to do too, which I think is super interesting is this idea of also like Asian American food, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, one example that I loved is that when Noodle Bar opened, it was one of the first ramen restaurants that opened uh, in the East Village. And another one came in from Japan and they put a sign on their door that said, you know, we're authentic, Momofuku Noodle Bar is not, you shouldn't hear because we were using um, Benton's Bacon from Tennessee. We were using, um, you know, local produce, all these things. And then Dave put a sign on the door that said, you know, like, if you want authenticity, don't come eat here because that's not what we're doing. And if that's, you know, that's not the fight we're trying to win. Dave was trying to make food that made sense for New York City, for him as a Korean American cooking Japanese food uh, in, in, in New York. Um, and I think that's always been our goal is to kind of like try to um, uh, kind of bridge this gap between, you know, America and Asia and finding kind of, you know, Dave growing up in the South and what that looks like uh, as well. And so, um, I really think that as a company, we believe that food helps create that connection and helps open those doors and starts conversations around a lot of these things. I mean, one great example um, is uh, MSG. I don't know how much you know about MSG, um, but uh, there's you know this idea that uh, MSG has negative health ramifications, and it, literally it was called in a like uh, un un like founded uh, uh, medical review document uh, Chinese restaurant syndrome even though MSG appears in Doritos, it appears in um, accent, it appears in all these things that exist across cultures. Um, there was this stigma and idea about it uh, as it related to Chinese food. And so Dave has spent the past like 15 years trying to fight that and bringing in food scientists. Um, and you know, we say on our website, uh, our products don't contain MSG, but we say like, we love MSG, they're just not in these products. And how can we kind of change the narrative on that um, and use our voice and use our restaurants to change the conversation around uh, some of these topics, which uh, kind of are legacy issues that um, are still around today. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's excellent work as someone who's also a huge fan of MSG and think it should be in a lot more things. I, I would absolutely <laughs> completely agree with that. Um, we've received already a couple questions in the Q&A chat, and I just want to make sure that they're recognized. Anybody who also has more questions should feel free to contribute. The first one comes from Alan M. Christenfeld from the class of 1973. Um, he asks, what do you foresee as being the norm for restaurants in general, and yours in particular, once people are going back to them in good numbers following COVID? Do you expect them to raise prices considerably to compensate for reduced capacity? And will you be limiting your offerings or otherwise adjusting your menus? Uh, yeah, so, so what I would say is that I think there's been an issue which I spoke to a little bit about food not costing what it should cost for a long time now. Um, I think that there's a general lack of interest in paying more for food, even though, um, you know, as some of you may know, the, no, the numbers of operating a restaurant are not great. The margins are really slim once you factor in labor, cost of ingredients, uh, especially in major cities like New York City, uh, Los Angeles, rent being a huge factor as well. And rent utilities uh, and, and what we pay our employees in a great way have continued to go up year on year. But people's capacity to pay more for that food, despite all those plugins, is not necessarily there. So I really do hope in some ways that people charge more for food, not just because of reduced capacity, but because there needs to be a more sustainable model moving forward for restaurants to continue to exist. Um, so that's one piece. Um, limited menus. I, I've heard that from some people too. I know there's some restaurants that feel as if they kind of offered something for everyone. There was the idea that you had to have a fish, you had to have chicken, you had to have a salad, you had to have this to get people in. And I think there might be some movement towards um, restaurants not being able to do that anymore or, or refocusing on maybe what uh, 
what matters to them. I think something that I've seen in New York City, at least, um, and in other cities we operate, is also, I think, it's been a really hard time for chefs, or a really hard time for anyone who works in restaurants, um, you know, just especially the summer going into everything. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, it's like, uh, it's funny, it's like, what what makes continuing to do this worth it for me, right? Or if you're, if you're someone operating a restaurant, and I think you've seen a lot of restaurants maybe cook different food than they have historically, right? Uh, we have a two Michelin star restaurant, which has been serving pizzas during the pandemic. And they're doing it because like, they're kind of like, why not, right? Like, like what, what do we have to lose? I mean, they're delicious. Um, and so they are doing that right now and they probably won't stop even once uh, things go back to normal. So I think it was kind of a eureka moment maybe from some restaurants of we don't necessarily have to serve this or that. We can kind of maybe have some fun with it, but also um, not having much to lose. Why not try something you've always wanted to try? So um, I think you'll see that. I think, you know, in general, I believe that you'll see more people cooking from home. I think everyone's like picked up so much skill over the past you know year and a half right like i think everyone's probably a better cook than they were uh 18 months ago um uh, and i would also say that you know our patterns have changed where we're also um you know people are shopping obviously more to then support that um people are um doing things like subscriptions from restaurants or ordering gold belly and all your access to getting like restaurant quality food um at home has improved so much or you know companies like ours that are now making products that you can use at home so i think you'll see people return to restaurants but i think you'll see changing behavior in terms of how much people are cooking at home as well yeah i think that um one quote that i uncovered kind of during my research that i thought really you could say it aged very well or very not well but you told eager in 2019 you asked how do you in 2019 have a restaurant group when the operation of restaurants gets tougher and tougher every year. I, I'm not sure if anyone could have foreseen that in one year, it would be tougher than it's ever been for any restaurant in the history of the planet. But I think it was very good foresight on your part. But I think part of your pivot into the home consumer products is fascinating. And you know, you told Yahoo back in February as well, that you and David Chang set a pre-pandemic goal of having 50% of your business not come from brick and mortar restaurants. So it's, yeah, is that, is that a goal that you've been able to hit? Is that something that is, you know, you're on track for? It? Yeah, I, I feel like it's funny. I, I think we're, we're getting there much faster than we thought. But I, I would say uh, the reason I said that is just because, uh, and I, I, I've said this before, it's like restaurants were not a sustainable model in 2019. So the fact that it broke during the pandemic is no surprise, right? Like it, it just, as I was saying, like costs have all go, gone up. People are not willing to pay more for food. Certain people are not willing to pay more for labor. And so it was always going to be something. And, and keep in mind, it's also a very heavily uh, hourly employed business, right? So you have all these kind of at-will employees. Like it's just, it, the pandemic really accelerated what was going to be, I think, a reckoning in the hospitality industry anyway. So, uh, and seeing that, and also, I guess I would add, like, there are certain restaurants that are so good at opening multiple restaurants, right? Like, you look at Cheesecake Factory, who there's, you know, New Yorker articles about how consistent they are. You look at Hillstone, uh, which is known for their, like, unbelievable training programs. Um, we're just not those people. Like, we're, we're not great at opening a consistent same restaurant. Um, it took us years to open a second noodle bar and then even more years to open a third. So for us, when we think about growth, it's not necessarily stamping out a bunch of restaurants uh, across the country. I think we'd love to do that for Noodle Bar at some point. But what we, you know, have learned is that, you know, we had to find ways to grow that weren't just brick and mortar. So what we really want to do is like complement restaurant growth with these other avenues. And um, we're doing online cooking classes, which are really awesome. We've had people from 50 states participate them, in them. Um, we have these CPG products. And so I think we see it as an ecosystem where all these things kind of help uh, rising tide lifts all boats and they all kind of get supported. And, um, you know, the, to your point on brand, they all contribute to this kind of like overall picture. Um, but that doesn't mean it needs to be a 4,000 square foot, you know, restaurant space. You can kind of grow in all these other ways. Um, and I think that's kind of where we see a lot of excitement because it actually allows us to then be better at restaurants, right? It allows us to potentially pay people more at the restaurants. It allows us to be a more sustainable system. If there was ever anything to happen like COVID again, how do we become more prepared and more ready? Um, I think about the fact that, you know, Nike, Apple, et cetera, like they could close their stores, but 
they still have product to sell, right? They still have uh, e-com, all these features. Very few restaurants had that, right? And now if you look at it, it's pretty incredible uh, what restaurants been able to spin up in the past year. And these are things that are not going away. I mean, uh, there's a subscription service called Table 22 where uh, you can subscribe to your favorite restaurant and monthly you can get wine. Uh, certain ones are doing like uh, conserva packs, all these different things. And those are just boons to the business, right? Even when the diners come back, why stop doing that, right? That's a kind of now a, a different uh, uh, kind of thing in your toolkit that you can continue to, you know, evolve and use, um, you know, whether it's good time or bad times. And so I think that that was a really uh, silver lining of all of this is kind of preparing everyone better for, for what's next. I think also too, like the landscape has shifted so dramatically, but one important thing to keep in mind, you know, I was alluding to this earlier, but like the food and restaurant scene in New York City is such an integral part of the culture, the atmosphere, it's part of the tourism industry. Like how is, how are restaurants in New York City going to be changed forever? I mean, with, you know, people working from home, less business lunches, yeah. like less you know, potentially tourism from the foreseeable future. Totally. How else are you adapting in your brick and mortar spaces? And where do you see sort of the, how do you envision like downtown New York City restaurant scene? Like, in yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't have all the answers. I, I think we're, we're definitely, I mean, it's beautiful here in New York City today. We're definitely starting to see more people coming out. We, uh, New York City changed all the rules around outdoor dining to make it way easier and kind of more equitable for restaurants to set up uh, outdoor space. So that's been incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there was some article about how tourism is not going to come back in full force to New York until like 2026. Um, you have uh, uh, vacancies at offices at an all time high. Um, it will be, I mean, the way that we're looking at it is really like you have to um, really appeal. I mean, it, this has always been true for restaurants, but like your regulars, right? Like your local customers are everything right now. And, and they definitely were this summer and they were this fall. And I think that's going to continue to be the case. And so we actually, during the pandemic, reduced our footprint. We used to have many more restaurants in New York. Um, and we made the really tough decision to close some of them just because um, we looked at not just getting through, it was not about making it to through the pandemic, it's what does the next couple of years of after that look like, right? That's where things actually get dicier in some ways. Um, so uh, I don't know, I don't have all the answers yet, but I think we are like really leaning into uh, making sure just to the question that was asked earlier about, about what you're serving. You know, it is important that we're serving Pizza Co. It is important that we're serving, um, you know, kind of like fun uh, menus. And, you know, we had a restaurant where the menu changed basically every other week, we just completely changed it. And that's all kind of towards this idea that you're kind of, uh, you have a captive audience that you need to capture as opposed to it potentially being uh, in the, you know, older times where you had an endless flow of tourists uh, or, or business meals. So we're trying to adapt, but it'll be interesting to see how, how that uh, goes in the future. I want to shift gears a little bit. We got a great question from, two-part question from Shane Nanteus. Um, and I think this sort of pertains to the idea that, you know, as Bowdoin students and alumni, something that we have in common is the idea of the common good. He's asking what type of common good focused food startup sparked your personal interests, whether that be in New York City or nationally? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the things that I think are really interesting are the things that uh, you know, I think fundamentally like impact. I mean, you have to think about food, I guess, like I think about food, I guess, on a more daily basis as it relates to the restaurants, but food obviously has like such, such major impacts on the country as a whole. Uh, and so uh, agriculturally, uh, all, all these pieces. And I think the things that are super interesting right now are people that are basically trying to like future proof food, right? So how are we making sure that we're eating better, but also more sustainably? So uh, there's these like amazing startups right now um, that have proven essentially that feeding cows, pigs, other, uh, especially I mean, cows are the biggest offenders, but uh, feeding either seaweed or lemongrass uh, greatly reduces their carbon emissions. And so uh, there's like some startups out there that are trying to figure out how do we kind of prove that scientifically? And then how do we try to convince the government to then, you know, similar to how you have with like carbon credits, give uh, kind of subsidies to farmers to kind of adapt better practices um, because something like that uh, on a national level could just have like such insane ramifications for, for the country as a whole. Um, and I think you see that, I think you see a lot of it in kind of um, people that are trying to um, push forward uh, 
uh, vegetarian, vegan meal alternatives to meat, I think is also really interesting, just in that um, the more you know about uh, commodity farming, the more uh, you know that it is not only negatively impacting the planet, but also just not where we should be uh, as a country. And so whether that's reform or whether that's uh, creating alternatives, um, you know, that, you know, I, I believe that as you know, 20 years from now, we're all going to be eating less meat and it's going to become more and more of a, a luxury item, or I at least hope it does. Um, so I think that there's a lot of interesting things happening there. But yeah, I think the ideas that are the most interesting to me are the ones that can not just impact restaurants, but also impact the, the country as a whole, because it all is so interconnected. And, and one other interesting thing, I think, too, um, is also just like, um, I don't know, there's this interesting organization called Heritage Foods that's basically trying to bring back um, or, or kind of uh, strengthen um, uh, these uh, uh, like old, old uh, lines of animal breeds. And it's twofold, right? It's like, A, it's more delicious, which is why you convince chefs to do it. But then it's also, um, it's for like the safety of our, uh, our animal populations to not have like the same genetic makeup for, you know, the vast majority of our animals. I mean, that's how things like mad cow disease happen. So it's like an interesting thing where it's both the like delicious option as well as the most sustainable. And I think those two things usually go hand in hand and where you can kind of uh, find those, uh, those pieces. I think there's like so much good that restaurants can do in terms of popularizing those ideas as well as um, just providing, you know, obviously a, a delicious meal. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I, uh, I don't geek out a bit. It's just uh, on how we kind of create a, a better model moving forward. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about Momofuku specific initiatives and what you've done sure. in the past and what you have planned in the future to sort of address sustainability concerns around restaurants? Sure. So, uh, so Heritage Foods is one of our biggest partners. It's where we get the vast majority of all of our pork as it relates to our pork buns, our bosoms, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I think they're a really incredible organization um, and they do a lot of education themselves um, on top of that. And they, you know, similar to everyone else during the pandemic switched to immediately starting, you know, doing mail order and sending it to consumers in addition to what uh, we've been doing. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. I think for us, another huge piece, um, it, it's just A, using the right ingredients, but then also uh, education. So like uh, we've done a lot of work with Edible Schoolyard, which is an organization that operates uh, gardens in New York City uh, public schools with the idea being that the only way that any of this is actually going to matter is if you teach kids at an early age about the difference of a lot of these things, right? Or what does it taste like to grow your own vegetable basis, the, the vegetable you might get at the grocery store. And, you know, that you can make a affordable meal um, that's, you know, uh, plant-based or that, you know, uh, is at a cheaper price point than maybe even fast food that you would get. So I think that if you can convince a younger generation that that's true, then you can kind of change the makeup of what this looks like moving forward and also like who cares about this stuff, right? Um, so we've done a bunch on the education front, especially as it relates to uh, children. And then I think for us as a company, it's just, you know, wherever we can, making sure that we're not just using ingredients that we think support that future facing uh, idea. Like we, for example, um, uh, launched Impossible Foods, which is a meat alternative in our restaurants. Um, we were the first restaurant to sell it uh, in New York uh, with the idea being, you know, maybe not right now, it might right now be the same price as meat, but what's going to happen once again in 20 years and 30 years, how are we going to get to a different place? Um, and, you know, we want to start those conversations, right. And have those with our guests, because uh, I think, you know, Momofuku has always been bigger than our footprint, if that makes sense. Like uh, we've always had restaurants, but I think uh, our brand has maybe been outsized to that. So how do we make sure that we're leveraging, not just what we serve, but then also like vocalizing that on social, uh, in the press, et cetera, because that's what we think actually is going to change. Uh, what the future looks like. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, there's not too many uh, restaurant groups, well, apart from Cheesecake Factory that uh, made its entrance into this conversation earlier that have such an international presence and such an impact. But um, I mean, I don't know, maybe like a 400 page menu will be in your future at some yeah. point. Um, going back a little bit to your career path and sort of your development, like I think it's something that's fairly unique that someone starts out at an intern and less than eight years later, they're the CEO of the company. And like, I think one thing that's interesting about that is that you, your trajectory in getting to the CEO position has sort of been marked by a focus on image and branding and PR. 
Like, so as you've taken on responsibilities and oversight, not relating to your, to branding in your role as CEO, um, do you believe that your creative background and perspective gives you an advantage when you make important business decisions? And if so, how? Uh, sure. I mean, I, you know, I think that what's really interesting about maybe Momofuku, which is different than other companies, is I think that for us, like brand and marketing is so intertwined with everything we do, right? So um, like what we're serving, how we're communicating it, um, you know, they're in a kind of great way. Um, there's always been like so much conversation between all these pieces, right? Like, cause I would, you know, I would have said this, you know, even like three or four years ago, like what you pay people is part of your brand, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, what, what, how you're sourcing your ingredients is part of your brand, right? So even if I worked in the brand, uh, you know, department or, you know, on that front, um, you know, that to me, I think the beauty of Momofuku has always been like these kind of all being part of the same conversation, right? And so, um, and then, you know, also like I worked on, I was lucky to work on a lot of our new restaurants and what they looked like, right? And that also spoke to like, well, what kind of company are we? What kind of uh, food are we serving? What does this look like? So, um, so I think we're, we're a unique company in that we don't really silo these pieces, right? Where it's like, oh, here's a finished product, you know, marketing, go market it. Because, you know, I think at the end of the day, that's not what's successful. It's like, how do you build products, build dishes, build restaurants that fulfill a need, um, which is, I think, what we try to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a learning curve uh, as I've, as I've uh, uh, spent time at, at Momo. And I think that, um, you know, I've been lucky. It's a small enough company that I was able to like really see everything, um, you know, and, and be involved in a lot of conversations prior to getting to where I am now. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's an interesting, I, I think it helps in that, like, you know, I, I really look at product, right? And, and I look at Mufuku as a product, other restaurants as a product. Um, and I always have just coming from this kind of like design, uh, marketing, forward facing perspective. And um, I've been lucky enough, I guess, to do that and then kind of like reverse engineer, um, you know, uh, as I've gotten more involved and, and responsibilities have grown, just kind of uh, maybe paying attention or working on more components of that. But um, I think it's definitely been helpful to have that kind of like bird's eye view, right? Or, or that public facing view um, uh, as, I've, as I've gone through this. Um, and like, I was also lucky I started right at the time where like, I, I started our Instagram account, I started our Tumblr, like it was like right at the time where all of these tools started to be available to businesses to like tell their own story, right? It used to be like, oh, if you had an event, you had to like tell your PR company and then they would, you know, talk to the press and then it would get put somewhere. And it was right, right at the time of like Twitter starting to get big, Instagram launching. And so it really changed, I think, like what as a brand we were capable of doing ourselves and what we were capable of communicating ourselves, um, uh, which I think has, you know, also obviously fundamentally altered restaurants as a whole uh, moving forward. Yeah, I think one thing that, you know, you mentioned just in what we've been talking about is that you've sort of had a role in sort of a seat at the table and pretty much like every part of Momofugu's development after you arrived. Like, and I think one thing that came up a lot when I was you know, reading articles on Momofugu is that like your leadership style seemed really kind of based around your, your involvement in really any task that comes across your way. Like there's one conversation about how you're holding doors open for people at like, you know, a restaurant because there's no one else there to do that. And that you have a say in like, you know, the placemat design of every restaurant. Like, how do you, like, as this restaurant group continues to grow and as this lifestyle and consumer products brand continues to grow, like, how do you continue to have, like, sort of that influence and sort of that, like, engagement with every part of your your company? Uh, so I think, I don't know, I think it's, one, having very, very talented, great people that work at the company, I think is part of it. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've had to learn to like, let go of things and let other people uh, take the reins on a lot of that. Um, but I also think, I don't know, I, I think two things I would say, like one is that it is really important, I think, uh, for me to be aware of what's happening. Like we, we have daily logs that go out for all the restaurants, like what happened last night, what were the sales, who came in. Um, and I think it is really important that, you know, uh, maybe I, I used to read every single one every single day, but I think it is extremely important that like I'm aware of what's happening on the ground because 
I, you know, I think fundamentally that's our business, right? It's like what's happening every night in the restaurant and the, the impact that we're having on people. Um, you know, so I think what I would say is that, um, I don't know, one thing I actually did want to know, because I know you were saying that there's, there's students uh, on this, is I, I think one thing that I would like uh, really advocate is like when I started, I did do just like just about everything. And it was really like almost like a survival tactic. Like I like made myself indispensable. Like I was uh, there, they would have to like kick me out because I was getting to be over 40 hours as an intern and I would have to be paid overtime. So like, I really just tried to like anything I could take, I would do anything, um, you know, uh, projects, et cetera. And I think that um, especially in an industry like restaurants, which is great in that there's like very little formal education, right? It's like, it's not like, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer, like really the bar to entry a lot of times is just being willing and able and, and happy to, to be there. Um, and I think if you show up and you put in the work, um, that's something that is like extremely uh, admired. Um, and I think that that actually really helped me, I would say in my entire career and that like no one questioned whether like I would work as hard as them, right? Or like no one would question whether I was there um, to help them. And I think a lot of my job is actually just helping other people achieve whatever they want to achieve. Um, so, you know, um, and I think that like, if, if you have that impression from your team, you're capable of getting so much more done. So um, I don't, that's my, that's my intern advice is just uh, like being, being an annoyance and that you're, you're always there. Uh, and then eventually they, they might hire you. For the students on the call, if you want any more intern advice, make an appointment with the career advisor at career exploration and development. That's what we're there for. Thank you, Margaret, <laughs> for that shameless plug right there. Uh, <laughs> one thing that I think sort of I'm wondering as you know, you've spoken about your different ventures and sort of your different visions at Momofuku Lake. And I know that this might seem like just a huge question down the road um, considering all the new ventures that you have, you know, a role in right now. Like what's sort of the future of Momofuku? Like five, 10 years out from now, like what's it gonna look like? Is it going to be, you know, continue to sort of find new pockets of markets that are, you know, expanding and growing due to a changing restaurant landscape or, you know, will emphasis be brought back into the brick and mortar restaurants? And like, don't want you to give up any uh, trade secrets here, but. Uh, so what I would say is I think that, I, I have some idea, which I, I can talk through, but I would also say like, what's made Momofuku Momofuku is that uh, Dave has said, you know, for years, if we're not in the restaurant business in 10 years, like, great, right? Like, I think for us, it's less about like, the particular means in which we are communicating and more about uh like just kind of being in food i think we'll always be in food like it, but you know dave currently uh, has a deal with hulu where he's doing a bunch of kind of food media and programming he has a podcast uh we're doing cooking classes we sell packaged food that you can use at home um we have restaurants we have qsr concepts uh that are you know in, in stadiums like for us, I think it's more about um, like connecting with people and, and this idea of um, like providing like deliciousness, you know, and, and value wherever we can. Um, but that looks different, right? That during the pandemic meant us um, delivering that to people's homes um, that used to be restaurants. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll continue to diversify. And as I, I mentioned before, like have this ecosystem where all these pieces, like the, the great example that I always use is we had a special at one of our restaurants called Major Domo, where it was a smoked prime rib that used our like savory salt. And so we like posted on Instagram that we had this special. We only had, you know, X that night. And then we also had a link to buying this savory salt. And we both sold out of the special, um, you know, like almost immediately when we opened. But then we also were able to send savory salt to like all these other states that we don't have restaurants. And so, um, you know, and then we can provide a recipe of how you can cook that at home. So really broadening the reach. I mean, one fact that I, always talk about is that uh, between Momo and Dave, we have uh, over 2 million uh, followers on Instagram and 90% of those people don't live in cities in which we operate restaurants. So that means that like for 90% of the people that follow us, they're following us because of the brand. They're following us because of uh, who we are, um, but we've never had anything to offer, right? Like you just, you know, hey, if you're happening to visit New York, if you happen to visit Las Vegas, come to one of our spaces, but that was basically it. And so now with these classes, with these products, we're able to engage with like actually like the true extent of the people that, you know, love the brand or, or love uh, 
uh, Momo. And that's like the coolest thing, right? So I think you'll 1000% be looking into more ways to do that because like, we kind of like realized like, oh, we've been like kind of shutting out 90% of these people um, that, you know, are, are reading these specials or, or seeing this event that's happening in X city. So that for us, I think is super, super interesting and exciting. Um, but then I guess I would caveat by saying like, you know, if in five years we're doing none of these things and we're in a completely different business, like I'm also okay with that. Cause I think it really is like, what's the need, what makes sense and you know, how do we continue to grow? Um, and we follow that path as opposed to necessarily saying like our business is brick and mortar and this and that. And so, uh, and that's what I think has been fun. It's like, even though I've worked at this company now for close to 10 years, you know, it's like every year kind of feels like a different company in some ways, right. Or you're doing and learning something new. I also want to make sure that we get to touch on any final questions that come from our chat. I know we have some very engaged viewers. That's also halfway a shout out to anybody who wants to ask a question for Marguerite. Um, one question coming in from David Burnham. He said, hey, Marguerite, great conversation. Thank you. We are headed to Soho in late June slash early July. Love the food scene there. Any recommendations we should hit while there? Uh, yes. Uh, there's this restaurant called King that I really like. It's like three women uh, who met working at the River Cafe in London, which is one of my favorite restaurants, which I unfortunately have not been able to go to uh, for the, the pandemic. Um, but uh, it's a lovely and they have a lovely outdoor seating area that was actually designed by a uh, set designer, like a Broadway set designer, um, which you know I thought was also like an inventive way of kind of like leveraging kind of all these different industries that uh, have been hit by the pandemic. Um, so that's a lovely place. Um, what else? Um, we just opened this restaurant. We just reopened this restaurant that uh, we've had for 15 years called Sambar. We just moved it to a new location at South Street Seaport, where we have this like massive outdoor area, which, you know, Momo Food was never had before. Um, and, you know, it, we moved from this old building in the East Village, which was like crumbling in on itself um, to this, uh, now the kitchen has a uh, view of the water, which is something that I don't think Dave or I ever thought was going to happen. So uh, it's, it's really lovely as well. But yeah, I, New York is, is gorgeous now. And, uh, and you really start, I'm, I'm very excited for the summer to see, uh, hopefully people start moving back from Miami and it starts uh, getting a little bit more lively and uh, people return to restaurants indoor or out. So very exciting. Another one just came in from Michelle LePage. He asked, are you in collaboration with any other voting grads in this food space? Yeah, so it's actually so funny. So um, uh, David Gruber, who I actually did a talk with, with uh, Tom Kaplan. Uh, Tom Kaplan uh, works for Wolfgang Puck um, out in Las Vegas. And then um, Lydie, uh, who uh, was Ina Garden's assistant uh, and uh, now is, is doing recipes with the New York Times. Uh, we were all, I mean, Tom is, is, is uh, a different generation, but we all just happened to be at Bowdoin at the same time. Um, and I think part of it's timing and that I think, you know, careers in food, I think became a lot more prevalent around the time that we were graduating. But I also think um, maybe a lot of people don't even know that it is a career path you can go into. And I think having a friend who is doing this uh, probably helps in terms of pulling other people into it. Um, so it's been great. I and mean, we've done some events for Bowdoin. Uh, we did a talk um, pre-pandemic. We were going to try to get Lighty to do a dinner. Um, so hopefully we can keep uh, keep those up. But I think there's a great uh, food uh, kind of uh, alumni network that's building. Um, and I, one thing I would say is there's this, um, I can't remember his name, but there's a kid who was a couple of years. Uh, I went to like an accepted students in New York um, uh, party um, a couple of years ago. And there was a kid who uh, took a year off and he staged in Paris um and uh was then going to go to Bowdoin and that blew my mind and that like I went into food but like m the idea of my parents you know even, like even five years removed you know saying that it was cool for me to go to work in a kitchen for a year before I went to Bowdoin would have like maybe blown their minds and so the idea that like I think it's almost becoming more and more prevalent right or the understanding of kind of the careers and the the kind of food in general is expanding and expanding and so I think you'll start seeing more and more people uh, going into uh, food um, uh, and just, I don't know, the general awareness. So I don't know, I thought that was the coolest thing. I wish that I had taken a year off and staged in Paris before going to Poland, but maybe one day. Maybe one day. And speaking of, on sort of the collaboration vein, 
um, Kristen Hancher uh, asks, do you collaborate with other chefs slash restaurants either on food related projects and or broader sustainability or social projects? How do you go about finding new groups to collaborate with? Totally. So, um, I mean, I think at least as it relates to our restaurants, like we're so lucky in that we have like unbelievable talent in all of our restaurants and we really try to empower those individuals to put their mark on their restaurants. So, and that's once again, why we're not cookie cutter. Uh, so for example, um, you know, you might have at, um, uh, the restaurant, uh, Sambar that we just reopened, you know, Dave is Dave, he's Korean American. He grew up in Virginia, um, you know, studied in Japan. The chef there though is Joe. She grew up in Korea, um, moved uh, to the States when she was about 16. Um, and her perspective is not one-to-one -one with Dave's at all, right? Like she has the things that she's interested in, the dishes that she wants to create, a different style of food. And I think what Momofubi does really well is giving people like Joe the space to create their menu. And we're there to help, you know, edit, we're there to help support, we're there to help um, uh, with that. But we don't want it to be all of Dave's food, right? We don't want it to all be um, this like corporate system, like what makes our restaurants unique is I think the chefs bringing their own, uh, you know, personal experience into it. Um, and that's, you know, and once again, you know, that's what also I think fulfills the chef and fulfills the team there. So um, I would say we're collaborating on a daily basis. It's never kind of top down, this is what needs to happen. It's really a conversation around what should this restaurant be? How are we hitting, uh, the right the right price point the right dishes uh, for, for the different uh, people coming through um and then other restaurants and social causes for sure i mean uh it, right now in new york city um you know uh there's a great organization called enough is enough which is doing a lot uh with aapi um where it's basically trying to get together all uh you know not all but but really attempting to broadly kind of co uh, collect um Asian restaurants in the city and what impact can they have collectively as opposed to as the individual. So we're talking to them about uh, doing some more programming. Um, and I really think it is, um, you know, also restaurants in terms of sourcing, uh, holding a lot of our suppliers accountable, right? For like, if, you know, there's a standard in terms of sustainability, a standard in terms of um, uh, sourcing, um, those are things that we can do as a collective so much better than we can do as individual restaurants. So uh, definitely, I would say in the pandemic, there's been more focus on that maybe than before. And I would say just one last thing on this is that, um, you know, you look at government support, right, in the pandemic, and you look at airlines, and you look at cruises, and they're these massive industries, and therefore, they're able to way better organize. What's been so interesting during the pandemic about restaurants is they're literally all these independent restaurants are one of the largest employers but it's completely fragmented, right? It's like every restaurant employing 20, 50, 100 people. And so it's been so interesting about the pandemic is the ability for, for the first time really, uh, whether it's the independent restaurant coalition that came together or Roar, which is a New York based organization. I was having conversations with people from other restaurant groups for the first time ever, right? Like, hey, how are you guys doing this? Are you guys applying for this? What's going on over there? Um, just because you had to. Um, and so in, in a silver lining, there's more, I think, connectivity and more um, collaboration than I've ever seen across restaurants, um, just because we all needed to like fight together to, to survive. Um, so it's been really cool to meet uh, just a ton of different voices uh, in the space. I think we have time for one or two more questions. One that I really want to get to due to my slight bias for career development. This <laughs> one is from Bram Hollis, who asked, do you have, do you have any advice for Bowdoin students hoping to cook or work in the restaurant industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think really at the end of the day, it's like being um, like, I, like it's, it's a really interesting industry in that I don't think culinary school is even like a prerequisite, right? It's really about like learning and like wanting to learn. So something that we talk about all the time is like the, the best employees that we have are the ones that want to grow, who want to learn, who are their own harshest critics, right? Like they hold themselves to a standard. Um, and a lot of what you do in restaurants, you can learn, right? Just like on the job. And so I think a lot of it is just having the right attitude um, and going in and and, uh, and kind of making yourself indispensable, as I said. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, right now, let me tell you, in New York City, there's, there's a desperate need for a uh, for, for restaurant workers. So uh, if, if you're, you know, I don't know how old you are, but if you want to come to the city, I think now is also a really good time um, where, uh, you know, 
there's always been somewhat of a, a you know a constant need to to hire, but uh, now more than ever. So there's opportunity. Marguerite, I really want to thank you for spending this hour with us. It is such a pleasure, and it's one of the best parts of my job to communicate and work with awesome alumni who are doing some incredibly interesting things. It's also just a huge contribution to the Bowdoin community. So thank you so much for joining us in this virtual setting, and we hope we can get you back on campus at some yeah, point. Yeah, I hope so too. My, my 10 year reunion was canceled, which uh, is tragic, uh, but I, I will be back uh, soon, I'm sure. Yes, and we would also, you know, if you think of it, if you could bring some food, that would also be amazing, but <laughs> put that out there. Thank you everybody for coming today. This Coffee Break program was brought to you by the Office of Development and Alumni Relations, and the Office of Career Exploration and Development. As someone asked, there will be a recording of this conversation posted somewhere that will be followed up with you shortly. And yes, thank you so much for attending. Keep an eye out for the next Coffee Break coming up in the fall. Thanks everyone.